So here's our little timeline, and we're right here. We're at the, before the start of the tribulation, we're <coughs> at the vision of the menorah. Everybody say menorah. menorah. And we're at the seven churches, each candle holder <coughs> representing one of the seven churches. Okay? I'm going to go through this kind of quick with you guys this morning. Part of it to review, then we'll get to our new stuff. This morning we're talking about Smyrna. Everyone say Smyrna. Smyrna. Now, Father, I praise you and I thank you for the good word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Smyrna. Now, last week I talked to you that all seven of these churches in Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3 are all located in what was Asia Minor and today is the country of Turkey. Turkey. Okay. Now, I talked about how these seven churches uh, were seven real churches in Asia at the time they were written. These represent seven distinctive parts to church history, some of them even overlapping, okay? Uh, you look at the early church from the year about 180 to about 220 AD. Uh, in that year, during that time of the Emperor Diocletian and some other folks, that was the time basically of the Smyrna church age, okay, that we're going to talk to you about this morning. And then these represent seven distinctive types of assemblies or of congregations today. Now, how many of you know, in our mind, there's all these different denominations, non-denominational churches, non-denominational denominations, and how many of you know God sees us as one body from his perspective, amen? amen. But we're all different members, and every member has a different purpose. <coughs> the pinky doesn't do what the thumb does, amen? amen. You know, I had a, a, a fella from a large church here in this city. My wife and I had met him, and um, he just was like, "Well, you know, if you're in no other, if you're here in the city for no other reason than to do what you're doing with, you know, uh, working with the messianic congregations, then good thing you're in the city." I'm like, "Well, brother, you gotta remember this congregation has been here for 50 years before your church was ever around." These people, this congregation has been praying for this city. Some of these big churches out there didn't get that way just because they got an awesome budget and big programs. They came because somebody spent somewhere a lot of time in prayer. Someone say amen. amen. And folks here have been praying in the spirit for 50 years for this city. 50 years. Am I lying, guys? I mean, Jim's been here 30 years. 30 years? That's a seven. 37 years, okay? Even before Jim was here, they were praying for the city, am I right? And other churches like it. I'm not just saying this. So I'm just saying that every assembly has different kinds of purposes and plans and different kinds of people. And something the Holy Spirit told me is this. For this coming year, 2016, I'm to embrace our uniqueness. Embrace our uniqueness. Those were three words straight from the Holy Spirit. Listen, I can't measure up. We're not going to be able to do everything that some of these guys with congregations of 505,000 do. Okay? We just can't. I want to do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And there are things that we can do, and we can do really well, yes. that they're not able to do because they're so big and so disjoined. Yeah. Are you following me? So, you know, I don't want to be comparing myself. You know, they give this and this and this and this at that big church. Well, that's awesome, but you know what? We need to do what's uniquely us. <coughs> uniquely us. We've got a Jewish pastor. I think it counts for something. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't make me better than anybody else. It just, I think I have a unique perspective on at least a few things here or there. And we've got some unique people. We've got a family, and that's what we are, is we are a family. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Maybe somebody didn't get called as often as they wanted to, or didn't get this or that. I mean, we're working, we're growing. So-and-so didn't say hi to me. Well, man, go say hi to them. You see what I'm saying? We're growing, we're family. Man, do you walk out of your house the first time your spouse gets upset with you? Lord have mercy, no. How many of you ever had your spouse get upset with you? <laughs> If I had more legs and arms, they'd all be up. <laughs> Thank God she gets a medal. Our spouses get medals for putting up with us men. 
All right, let's continue. Turkey, that's what the present country is. All seven of these churches were in the country of Turkey. Of course, Turkey's in the news. And this is all review, so I'm going fast. Revelation 1.12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And we talked about Ephesus last Sunday, this Sunday Smyrna, then Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay? Each church was individual. And each church, Jesus had a different message for. And what's funny is it was Jesus himself that gave the message. It wasn't just the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul. It was Jesus himself telling John, write this message to the churches. That's, I mean, it's just like, man, I don't want you to miss out on what God's saying. That's what he's saying. And so I'm going to verbally tell you, John, write it down word for word, and you give it to them. And that message is still resonating with people today. And I was first thinking about the church of Smyrna and reading through it. I was thinking, man, I'm not sure I have a enough to even use here for a whole message. But how many of you know, once the Holy Spirit starts giving you understanding, I was like, man, I've got to hurry through this or I'm going to have too much. <laughs> All right, so let me hurry. Revelations 2.8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Jesus reaches back to who he is now. He reaches back to the description of himself. How many of you recall in Revelation 1, 17 through 18, we read Jesus' description of himself. Remember, his hair was white like wool. His eyes were burning like fire. His feet like, like burnished brass. Remember the, the, the golden uh, uh, deal around his robe and his robe down to his feet? Remember, he had seven stars in one hand, and that was the description of Jesus to the churches. Now here in Revelation 1, 17 and 18, in the description it says, saying, fear not, this is Jesus speaking, I am the first and the what? The last. the last. And the living one, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. So in verse 8, Jesus reaches back to his description of himself. And what's fascinating is as you study Revelation chapter 2 and 3, every message to every one of the seven churches Jesus always reaches back and pulls some part of his description of himself and gives it to the church to encourage them. And the part that Jesus pulls back says, I am the first and the last who died and came to what? Came to life. Now listen, if you're a persecuted church and you're giving up your life for your faith, as some Christians are around the world, how many of you know that that message from Jesus is going to what? Encourage them. I am he who died and I came to what? Came to life. What's he telling them? There is a hope of the resurrection. Amen? He's telling them, don't be discouraged by the difficult times you're going through. Because even though you're being persecuted, even though the emperor's putting you to death, even though they're killing you with wild beasts and lighting you on fire, all the terrible ways they had of killing Christian believers in Jesus. In those days, he's saying, I am he who is dead and now I'm alive. And what did he say elsewhere? Whosoever believeth in me, though he be dead, yet shall he what? Live. live. Everybody say live. live. So if you're being persecuted, if you're like the Iraqi Christians, and the Syrian Christians, and you know, I don't want to get off in the political thing, but it just makes me crazy that we're bringing all the Muslims over and we've left the Christians there. Yeah, it makes yeah. no sense to me. Yeah. And uh, But anyway, that's just, ooh, boy. We just need to pray. Yes. Pray. But my heart goes out to these believers there because they've like been abandoned by our president. And they have not been abandoned by Jesus. Amen? Amen. And I think he would tell them if they would hear it, the same thing they told the church this morning. The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. All those who have been beheaded by ISIS and all the other ones. Did you know, how many of you know that San Bernardino shooting? Yes. One of the men who died and was killed was a Messianic Jew. He was a full-blooded Jew who was a believer in Jesus. He had witnessed to the terrorists two weeks prior to I shared this in Sunday school, witnessed to him, had told him about Jesus, 
had talked about the dangers of Islam, and the guy, so filled with this demonic spirit, uh, told him and said, you will never see Israel two weeks before he shot him to death. Wow. But you know what? That fellow is going to see Israel. Amen. One day he's going to come back to life. Amen. And he's with the Lord now. So, let's go on. Only believers in Jesus serve a living God. Amen. Revelation 17, 18, he says, And the living one, I died, and behold, I am what? Alive forevermore. Buddhists worship a dead man. They'll tell you, you ask a Buddhist, where is Buddha? Well, Buddha died. They'll even point to where they think his grave is. Dead. Okay, so you're worshiping a dead man. Muslims worship a dead man. Where's Muhammad? Well, Muhammad died. They worship a dead man. Confucianists. Not Confucianists, even though they're confused. Confucianist. You ever hear of that old Chinese proverb, Confucius, Confucius say? So Confucianists are people who follow the teachings of Confucian. Okay, I think I said that wrong, but you get the Confucianist <coughs> ideal. Confucianists worship a dead man. Confucius said, Confucius died. He's dead. Okay? Whenever you go in, you know, if you ever see a Chinese uh, at a Chinese restaurant and you see the Buddha there, and the big Buddha, and they've got dollars plastered all over, over him and everything else. I'm like, you know, I tell him, I said, that, that guy, isn't he dead? Didn't Buddha, oh yeah, Buddha died. Well, let me tell you about our God who is alive forevermore. Amen. You see, believers, guys, we don't serve dead religion or a dead man. We serve a living God. Amen. He who was dead and is alive forevermore. Amen. You see, it's the resurrection of Jesus that makes all the difference in the world. Someone say amen. amen. All the difference in the world. I get so excited because, listen, who did he resurrect from the dead? Not just did Jesus come back to life, but the greatest miracle is the fact that you and I were dead and he's resurrected us in our spirit even before he raised us physically. Weren't you a different person before you came to Christ? Amen. Shelley was sharing in Sunday school this morning how uh, uh, before she came to the Lord, she was just a different person. People have taken note. You're not the same way you used to be. Same way in my life. Hopefully the same way in your life. Amen. So you've been resurrected. You were dead, but now you live. You're alive unto God spiritually. But there is a day coming when the dead shall hear his voice. And they shall be raised up in perfection in beautiful bodies. All right, let's continue. Now here the Holy Spirit to each of the churches, as I shared last Sunday, gives a commendation. Everyone say commendation. To commend somebody is to tell them they're doing a good job. Like this morning, I gave Josh, I didn't mean to, darn it. I gave Josh, especially after that video last Sunday, where I to play that hairy bear. But I gave Josh a commendation. I said, Josh, you're doing a good job, which he is. I don't make stuff up. I mean, you can always find something good and true about somebody, amen? amen. Not there in a lot good and true about him, brother. But I went to commend him. Uh, I know. Love him like a brother. But I went to commend him on, on the administration. Please listen, every church that Jesus gives a message to, he always commends them. Isn't that beautiful? God commends. He doesn't just critique, he commends us. And so he gives a commendation to the church of Smyrna, and this is it. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. How many of you know the Lord knows the trouble that you go through in your life? He's telling the church this morning, guys, I'm not ignorant of the fact that you're dying for your faith. I'm aware of it. I know. I understand. How many of you know what the Lord said to Moses? Moses said, Lord, God, burning bush. He said, who do I say sent me when I go to the nation of Israel in Egypt? He said, tell them I am that I am sent you. Literally, I am and I will be what I will be has sent you. Listen, he still is. He's well aware of every difficulty that you're going through. Someone say amen. amen. You say, well, 
If he knows, how can he let this happen? The church is smarter. You don't think as they're being persecuted, they're thinking, well, God, you know, I know you're there, but why are you allowing this to happen? Listen, in this world, we're going to have trouble. Someone say amen. amen. This old pie in the sky, anything bad happens to us. Uh, nothing ever bad is supposed to happen to believers. That is not in my Bible. That's not in your Bible. It's how we handle the things that come up in our life. That doesn't mean you don't pray and believe God, but these folks were given their life for Jesus. Amen? And Jesus says, I know your tribulation. I know your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You see, the Jews there in Smyrna, I'm talking about the non-believing Jews, they didn't want the believers bringing Christ to them or to their congregation members. So they started to slander and to say evil things about them. And that's how false religion, that's how religions of the world, I don't care what religion it is, whether it's Judaism, Buddhism, Confucianism, any of them that deny Christ. Someone say amen. amen. Now, let's talk about this. Smyrna was a wealthy city. Now, isn't this amazing? Smyrna is a wealthy city, and yet the Lord says, I know your tribulation and your what? Poverty. Everybody say poverty. poverty. How many of you have ever lived in a wealthy city but walked in poverty? You don't have to raise your hand, but maybe it's happened to you. Listen to me. These folks weren't just suffering physical persecution. They were a severely persecuted church, but they were financially persecuted as well. Did you know that Christians can suffer financially because of their faith? I think his brother James shared a testimony one time, and I still remember. He was working at the retail department of a particular store, and he saw some unethical things going on there. And uh, it worked out where we he, he just didn't have his job there anymore because he couldn't go along with it. So sometimes as believers, you'll suffer financially even because of your faith and because of your ethics. The Lord says, I know. I know what you're going through. I know the tribulation. I know the trouble. I know your poverty. You are rich. Everybody say rich. Rich. Look at your neighbor or your wife or your husband and say, you are rich. rich. Honey, you are rich. You say, well, I don't feel rich. I wish somebody would tell my bank book that. <laughs> wish somebody would call my loan officer and say, you know, just want to tell you, had a word from the Lord, Bruce is rich. <laughs> Listen to me, you and I are rich in Jesus. Yes, amen. I showed you guys that real before. Our life on this earth, guys, is a vapor of smoke. Here for a moment and then gone the next. And yet the rewards we have in heaven last forever. Everybody say forever. forever. How long is forever? forever? Teenagers, how long is forever? Forever. Forever. It's a long time. Like, man, I just barely made it as a teenager. How can I think about forever? And I get it. But forever is a long time. And you know what? We are. If you and I knew how rich we were, we'd probably live differently. Probably live differently. You say, oh, I'm getting too worked up over all this earthly stuff. I need to have maybe some less earthly stuff and more heavenly, eternal stuff. Amen? All right, let's continue. Physically persecuted. So these believers in Smyrna, they were financially persecuted. They were physically persecuted persecuted as well. Their material poverty, but spiritual power. Isn't that awesome? Even though they were impoverished materially, they didn't have a lot of stuff. Everybody say stuff. I love that message Kim Pittner preached. The message about stuff. Y'all remember that? I love that. I'm probably going to spill it one day. But I just love it. Because, listen, they didn't have a lot of material stuff, but they had spiritual power. Everybody say power. Power. No, say power. Power. Amen. They had spiritual power. Not just dead religion. Listen to me, guys. That's why churches are dying all over this nation. They are sick of dead religion. They need us to have spiritual power again. Amen. They need us to have the power of God's spirit. Amen. Someone say amen. Amen. 
Today we have spiritual poverty and little spiritual power. Amen. That's right. Pray little, little spiritual power. Yeah. But you know what? We're unique. Everybody say we are unique. We are, we are unique. unique. And I'm not going to spend every Sunday morning cursing the darkness. I'm going to say, what can we do to be different? Yeah. Amen? Amen? Forget the spiritual poverty out there. We're going to have spiritual riches. Amen. Forget the little spiritual power. We're going to have the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Unashamed and unabashed. Amen. Not because it's a this thing or that thing. It's because it's a Bible thing. It's a God thing. Amen? Amen. Now, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear. Everybody say, do not fear. Do not fear. How many of you have things in your life that you fear? I do. I know we shun. Everybody say, we shun. I get that. And I tell you, maybe I'm not as spiritual as you, because I have a couple things I fear. I shared this in Sunday school. I fear doctors. I don't like being at the doctor's office. I don't mind if I'm going, like, because you're there. Like, when I went to visit Ray... Doesn't bother me. I feel bad he's in pain, but it doesn't bother me. But it bothers me when I had to go to the doctor's before I went to visit him, and I'm like, well, we gotta go because I've got a doctor's appointment next door. And we went to the doctor's, and he, I was a nervous wreck by the time I got over there, brother. I said, man, here Ray is laughing, joking, just had his finger cut off, and I can't even sit still in that waiting office. I mean, it's just a nervous wreck. And we were sitting in the waiting room so long my wife finally had to go get our son. And so she left me there. So I had nobody to hold my hand. I said, dear Lord, thank you that it's women who give birth. Or the planet would be barren if it were up to us men. But listen, do not fear what you're about to suffer. This is what Jesus tells the church of Smyrna. What you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulations. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And listen, people speculate on what those ten days were. Some say it was the ten emperors who brought persecution to the believer during that time. There's ten of them. Uh, some say it was this, some say it was that. Listen, the point is, is Jesus says, number one, do not fear. Do not fear. Now, how many of you know that's easy when you're not going through? Amen. It's easy for me to stand here. I mean, you should, do you mind if I use you as an example, right? Say, Ray, don't fear. It's just a finger. That's easy. But if you're Ray and it's your finger, it's another story. Yeah. Everybody say amen. Amen. So, when I'm preaching, when I'm teaching today, I'm talking to myself and I'm talking to you. Jesus said, do not fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Who's perfect love? God's love. Listen, and I, I was sharing this this morning again, and I know some of you are hearing it, but it's good enough to tell you twice. Fear is to Satan what faith is to God. Okay? This is my saying. Fear is to Satan what faith is to God. Faith is that which cannot be seen and calling it as though it is. Isn't that right? The Bible gives us that definition of faith in the book of Hebrews. Okay? Now, fear, what's fear? Fear is calling that which cannot be seen as though it is. But it's an, in an evil, unbelieving, full of doubt way. You're believing for bad things instead of God things. Amen? And so we've got to get to the place in our life where we stop living and walking and moving in fear. Now, only the Holy Spirit can help you with that. Some people have a horrible fear of death. Some people have the fear of this, the fear of that. Whatever your fear, how many of you have a fear of at least one thing? You don't have to tell me what it is. Raise your hand high. All right, everyone here, okay? Listen, whatever your thing is, Jesus says, do not fear. Do not fear. And he'll help us work through those fears. And he told the church of Smyrna, he says, look, he says, the devil's going to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You see, if it were us, it'd be, oh God, if there was really a God, he wouldn't have let me go through this. Is that what Jesus just told the church of Smyrna? No. He says, look, 
The devil's going to throw some of you guys into prison. He's going to test you. How many of you know that doesn't preach real well? We don't want to hear you're going to go through a hard time in your life. But I'm telling you, it's what Jesus says. And it's okay. He says, be faithful unto what? Unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Isn't that beautiful? Now, let's look at this. Not one word of critique to the church of Smyrna. Not one word. He has nothing in a critiquing manner to the church of Smyrna. His counsel. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, do not fear. That's his counsel, what you're about to suffer. Be faithful. Everyone say faithful. Faithful, faithful unto them. What's it mean to be faithful? Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give in. Everybody say don't give up. Don't give Everybody up. say don't give, in. don't give in. That's being faithful. But things are so dark. How can you don't give up? You don't give up. You don't give up. And again, not using Ray for part of my sermon illustration, like I'm fixing to again. But there was one day I went in to see him, and he was in such good spirits. And I mean, he really. I got to know Ray better than I have because I didn't know he was so funny. And I mean, he was just cracking me up. I can't tell you what, what he said because his wife said next to him, I don't want to get in trouble. But, <laughs> but it, was, it was funny. But listen, guys, when you're faithful, it doesn't matter what comes up in your life. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and you're just going to continue to plug through no matter what comes your way. Plug through, plug through, plug through, plug through, plug through. Listen, it's not how fast we run this race, but it's whether or not we finish and finish well. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to be bluntly honest with you guys. There are some of us, I throw myself in there, we're getting older. Some of us are closing towards the end of our race 10, 20, 30 years. If the Lord should tarry, am I right or am I wrong? Amen. Now you may live to be 104. But I want I want us as your pastor, I want us to finish strong. I want you to finish strong. I don't want you to be like one of these guys, yeah, you know, 20 years ago I prayed and got saved, hadn't done anything with my life for God since then. And then we wonder why nobody wants our brand of Christianity. Instead of, you know what? Jesus was dead and is alive and he lives in me. Yeah. Let me tell you what Jesus is doing in my life today. Someone say amen. 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 Fear is to Satan when faith is to God. Being faithful is also being fearless. Everyone say fearless. fearless. You say, but we're not always fearless. No, that's because we need to work on getting what? Getting more faithful in the things of Christ. Fearless in the face of adversity and persecution. Next time trouble comes in your life, look at what attitude you have towards it. And that'll kind of be your spiritual barometer as to where you are with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Prophecy. This is the prophecy. He gives them, Behold, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested for ten days you'll have tribulation. The greater the persecution the greater of a return to our first love. How many of you remember, what was the Lord's counsel to the church of Ephesus that we studied last week? For them to return to what? To their first love. Everyone say first love. So listen, their problem was they left their first love. Then all of a sudden, church history swings, and they're being persecuted, and all of a sudden, in the midst of persecution, guess what? Everybody's running back to Jesus. Amen. The greater the persecution, the greater people return to their first love. They're like, man, I need to get things right and put Jesus first in my life. We're being persecuted for our faith. Sound familiar? I see that happening in believers all over today. Not every church, but I'm talking about believers within churches are returning to their first love, putting Jesus first. The greater the persecution, the greater the unity. And all of a sudden, minor differences give way to an all-consuming love for Jesus. 
Amen. All of a sudden, you know what? When we're being persecuted for our Christian faith, the fact that this person doesn't quite believe everything in Scripture as I believe, but they love Jesus, they've been born again, they've been saved by his blood, washed by his blood, they believe in the resurrection of Jesus and the virgin birth. And all of a sudden, the differences don't make that big of a difference when you're both suffering for Jesus. You see what I'm saying? That's what we're coming to in our own lives and in our own American church. Mark my word. And I'm not even talking about persecution coming from ISIS. It's going to be from the unbelievers as never before. From the wicked, from the ungodly. Okay? You watch. <clears throat> Call for repentance. Wow. Not one word. Jesus didn't have a single word for the church of Smyrna. And you know what? Ephesus, the call for repentance was to return to what? To their first love. Return to their first love. But Smyrna, man, isn't that beautiful? What an awesome, awesome group of people. No call for repentance. They're suffering for their faith, they're impoverished, and they're loving God. What more could the Lord want? Don't ask for anything else. Consequence. If they don't repent, well, obviously, non-applicable. What do you tell Ephesus? Ephesus, if you don't repent and return to your first love, your lampstand, remember the menorah, is going to be what? Removed. Going to be removed. Going to be removed. Then two rewards were promised to the church of Smyrna. Revelation 2.10. And I will give you the crown of life. Everyone say crown of life. How many of you know? That sounds pretty good there. How many of you girls ever received a tiara for anything? You ever see, you know, a beauty pageant, they get tiara, and one. And what do you wish for the I wish world peace, and you know, they, they always want world peace, and she starts bawling and squalling, and you're the winner, and they put a tiara crown on her head. But listen, there is a crown of life coming to the believer. And so he offers, he tells the church of Smyrna, guys, if you're faithful unto death, I will give you the crown of life. How many of you know when Jesus promises to give a crown, that's a big deal? Did you know there's five crowns? Five. Everybody say five. five. I didn't know the New Testament said there are five crowns for believers. There are. There's a lot we don't know in the Bible. Five crowns. But I'm not going to teach on those this morning. That's for another time. Revelation 2.11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Amen. Everybody say second death. Second. Now that word conquer in the Greek, I talked about last week, same word. Nikao. Nikao. It means to conquer, to overcome, to prevail, to get the victory. And I talked to you guys about, remember how Jacob wrestled with God? And God, the angel of the Lord changed his name from Jacob to what? To Israel. And Israel is the one who prevails. Isn't that amazing? So here Jesus is telling the church of Smyrna to these congregation members, to these people, the one who conquers, the one who prevails, the one who overcomes, the one who gets the victory will not be hurt by the second death. You know what that tells me? Woo, Bruce, you better be an overcomer, you better be prevailing, and you better be conquered. And you know what? Can't do it in my own strength. But he who already is conquered he who has already overcome, he who already has captured the victory, lives in me. And through his power and his strength and reflecting him, I am able to walk as an overcomer. Someone say amen. amen. <clears throat> Wrapping it up, <clears throat> first reward we said, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, reward one, the crown of life, James 1.12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, you got to stay in the test, can't give in, he will receive the what? Crown of life. That's what we just read in Revelation 2.10. Wow. It talks about crown of life in two different places. It's a reward the Lord has for the believer, which God has promised to those who what? To those who love him. Everyone say love him. Amen. You know what drives me crazy? is people who with their mouth say they love him, but their life says I don't love him. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments and do the things that I said to do. Yes. And if any man says he loves me and doesn't follow after me, that man is a liar and the truth isn't in him. 
to those who love me are going to receive the crown of life. And those who remain steadfast under trial. How many of you have ever been under a trial in your life? How many of you are under a trial in your life right now? It's okay, don't be ashamed. We all have it. When you go under a trial in your life, you've got to remain steadfast. Well, how can I do that when you love him more than your circumstances, more than yourself? Amen? Remain faithful under trials. This will become increasingly significant as the end of this age approaches. Because I'll be honest with you, the trials for the believers are going to increase. Because right now we have everyday trials from just part of life. But I tell you by the word of the Holy Spirit, and I don't say this lightly, listen to me, the trials for the believer in this country are going to increase significantly. And if you can't handle the, I had a flat tire this week, how in the world are you going to handle when real trials and real tribulations like happened to the church of Smyrna come into your life? Ooh, don't be fearful. No fear. I say no fear. I'm just telling you. It's coming. Revelation 2.11, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now I'm really wrapping this up. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. How many of you think you know what the second death is? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let me see. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, five. You're going to know because I'm going to stop at this. But listen, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. Everyone say hear. 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 That means listen. Everyone say listen. listen. Now, I'm going to be picking on myself for a minute. In my marriage with my wife, there are times I hear and I don't always listen. <laughs> Can anybody relate? <laughs> and you know, there are times she hears, I'm an equal opportunity offender, there are times my wife hears and doesn't listen. Honey, did you hear what I said? Yes. Well, did you listen? Well, not always. Well, Jesus is telling us, don't just hear. See, Sunday morning, no different. Everybody hears. You're here. At least you're here. And you're hearing. You're here. But not everybody listens. Because when you listen, it'll change your life. Those of you watching by YouTube, if you listen, not just hear the words, it will change your life. Listen, hear. Be careful how you hear. Conquer, overcome, prevail. Get the victory through Jesus. Amen? And reward to not hurt by the second death. What is the second death? Yeah. Revelation chapter 20, yeah. verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Remember the dead in Christ will rise first? Yeah. And then the resurrection of the dead who have died in the tribulation. That's We call that the second part of the first resurrection. Over such... The second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for how long? A thousand years. Now, there's more stuff after that. You don't want to die, but that's just you're going to rule and reign with him on this planet for a thousand years as priests of God. How cool is that? Amen. Amen. And trust me, it'll be a lot better than what you and I are. As much as we love life today, that's going to be really awesome. Amen. But over such, the second death has no power. Wow, so what is the second death? What's it talking about? Revelation 20, verse 12 through 15. I want you to hear this. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. This is after, everyone say after. After the thousand year resurrection, I mean after the thousand year reign of Christ. And one day I'm going to do a study just on this. But I just want to give you a glimmer of an answer. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and hell gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Verse 14, Revelation 20. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
the lake of fire. So what's the second death? It tells us right here. The lake of fire. Everybody said the lake of fire. You said, well, Pastor, I thought, I thought hell was bad. I thought hell was the lake. No, hell's not the lake of fire. Hell, you might, the way I think of it, to, to keep things easy, I like to keep things simple in my brain. I have a simple brain. The way to keep things simple is I think of hell as the, the county jail. <coughs> okay? The county jail. It's like the holding jail until the great judgment. This is called the great white throne judgment. And here, those in hell and everyone receives a resurrected body. Yes, they're resurrected. And they're cast alive into the lake of fire, which is the second day. I mean, man, it sounds horrible. Yeah. Why is it so important to tell people about Jesus? Right here. Okay? Right here. Right here. All right. Let's all stand for